And when God visits his people, because he's an omnipotent God, he can do whatever he likes. He is like the light, and he refers to two different categories over which God has complete control. First, he says uh, nature, and he refers to nature. And what he's saying is, is that now I realize that God is totally sovereign. What gladdened his heart was the control of God. And what gla should gladden our hearts also is the control of God. I wonder today if I should speak on the topic of the earthquake in Haiti. I was going to, but then I decided to preach this message instead. When you look at the earthquake in Haiti, does God have anything to do with it? Of course. There are those who would like to distance God from what happens by saying either he's a weak God and he can't help himself because of the fact that he can't. He's uh, sort of stuck with what he has. And then there are those who say, uh, oh, the devil did it. Well, yes, maybe the devil did do it. The devil did these kinds of things in the book of Job. But notice that the devil wasn't able to do these things unless God allowed him to. Ultimately, everything is in the control and the hands of God, including what is happening in Haiti. You say, well, Pastor Lutzer, what is God up to there? I know a few things that he might be up to, but just because you and I don't have a complete explanation of what God is doing, that doesn't mean that there isn't one. Remember this, the righteous man will live by his faith, the Bible says. And so Habakkuk had to learn that. Could I say also, though, that one of the lessons there's no doubt that God is trying to teach through such terrible disasters is not the fact that Haiti is a worse country than some other country. We cannot say, for example, that Katrina happened at New Orleans because New Orleans is a city that is more wicked than, say, Las Vegas. The tsunami, you remember, as it went around, it destroyed many villages along the coast, but Bangkok, which is really the hub oftentimes of the sex industry, Bangkok was spared. So it's not a matter of us looking at this and saying that they deserved it or because of some previous commitment to the devil they had it coming. But what we must do is to recognize that the Bible teaches that natural disasters are a preview of coming judgment. Luke chapter 13, Jesus said, those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell, he said, were they greater sinners than other sinners in Jerusalem? He says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you shall likewise perish. Jesus was saying that these are the judgments that are coming. You look at the book of Revelation, it is filled with the judgments that come as a result of nature. For example, Revelation says, I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of the heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and the mountains and the islands were moved out of their places. And the great men, and the rich men, and the bondmen, and the freemen, they hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? God says, you look at Haiti, and you see the devastation. Remember that this is a cameo. Like when you go to a movie, there may be previews. This is a preview of coming judgment. And by the way, is it so difficult for us to believe in hell after seeing Haiti? I don't think so. Habakkuk finally realized that God is sovereign over nature. I didn't plan to quote it, but see if I can. Isn't it Isaac Watts who says, There's not a plant or flower below, but makes thy glories known, and clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. Habakkuk says, I realize now that God is in control. He's control of the ba in control of the Babylonians. He's not only in control of nature, but he's also in control of the people, the Babylonians and all. All of it rests with God. And blessed are those who believe him and trust him and live by faith. Let me ask you a question. 
How powerful were the Babylonians? How powerful is radical Islam that today in Nigeria they're burning down churches and Christians are being killed? How powerful is radical Islam? Could I ask a different question? How powerful is the devil? Maybe you've wondered that for a long time. I'm so glad that you came to Founders Week because this year, right now, in the next minute, you're going to have an answer to that question. The devil is as powerful as God allows him to be and not one whit more. Always remember that. As Martin Luther says, even the devil is God's devil. And if we should die as a result of violence, we would also die within the contours of the providence of God as all the martyrs before us have confessed. Because ultimately, God is in control of nature. God is in control of peoples. Listen to what it says, for example, in verse 11. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. And because of God's sovereignty, it is because of that that Luther could write, Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. And that little word is C-H-R-I-S-T. And so we go on believing because the righteous person, the righteous person lives by faith. So that was no doubt a great comfort to Habakkuk. But now let's ask another question, and that is, um, what else comforted him? First of all, the control of God that he was reminded of, and secondly, the care of God. I just read the text there where it says, You marched through the earth as in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people. Habakkuk thought back to the time when God was uh, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. He went back and he's, I'm sure in his mind he thought of the time when God was supplying them with manna and taking care of them. And he realized something, that no matter how bad it gets, God knows who his people are and God takes care of his people. God is the kind of God that we can trust. And so what he does here is he lays out for us a transformation of his focus that means that he is no longer obsessed with complaining to God, but he is now obsessed with giving praise to God. And what a difference that is. Now, let's pick it up in verse 16. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. Is this a description of you when you look at the headlines? My legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. I'm going to trust God's judgment on this. Yes, indeed, I am full of fear. My body is trembling. I've just heard from God. And as I think about the future, I am concerned because my nation is a nation that is now under judgment. But I'm still going to hope in God. And now what I'd like to do is to give a contemporary illustration or explanation of chapter 7 of uh, verse 17 and verse 18. And I do this with a great deal of sensitivity. I know that there are some of you who have lost your jobs and that's not easy. Some of you I'm speaking to in your house has gone into foreclosure. And so I want to be sensitive because I don't want to give the impression that we are callous toward that, or we simply say, well, trust God. I'm glad that my house is not under foreclosure. 